Hi, welcome back to the Personality Hacker Podcast. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. In a moment, we're going to dive into an interview with Ines, who identifies as an ESFP personality type. A few things to keep in mind before we get started. First, we may use some shorthand and technical language in this interview. So if you want to download of a handy guide that will help you visually follow along, visit personalityhacker.com and find that PDF directly below this episode. Second, Ines has been through our profiler training program. She knows herself and her type very well. With this in mind, we want to encourage you to look past stereotypes you might have for the ESFP personality type. Let's have a real conversation today. Let's hear from Ines on what it's really like to be an ESFP. If you're brand new to type, E stands for extrovert, S stands for sensor, F stands for feeler, P stands for perceiver. These four letters are called dichotomies, and they're what most people know about personality type. But remember, the true power of the system comes from understanding personality on a much deeper level. These are called the cognitive functions. In this interview, we'll dive into these deeper waters. To get an overview of the ESFP functions, Search for our podcast titled ESFP Personality Type Advice. The cognitive functions can be a bit technical at times, so I recommend downloading our handy ESFP guide. Remember, it's over at our website, personalityhacker.com, directly below this episode. Today, we have a special guest on the show. Uh, Ines Cassani is with us. Ines, welcome to Personality Hacker. Thank you. So Ines is currently working with Personality Hacker as our business manager. Uh, She came through our profiler training program, and that's how we got to know you, Ines, Mm -hmm. and meet you. And we ended up having you end up going through some advanced profiling and working with us as a profiler, but then also now work with us in our company at the time of this recording. Mm -hmm. And we're excited to have you on the team, and we're excited to talk you talk to you today because. You have a unique background. You have some unique perspectives on yourself and personality type. And mm-hmm. so we thought it'd be interesting to talk to you. So first of all, you actually don't even live in the United States. You work here with Personality Hacker, but you live across the ocean in Holland. Yeah. Just maybe tell us a little bit about your life. Just give us a sense of, of who you are and where you're coming from. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm originally French, but I've been living in the Netherlands for the last 10 years. My mom is actually Dutch. My dad's Moroccan, so I'm a bit of a mix of different cultures. And um, yeah, I used to work in HR for um, quite a few years in a big corporate um, international uh, organization and um, started taking profiler training. And then through that last year, started working for Personality Hacker. so. So what's interesting, I think, about you looking at type through all of these different cultural lenses, right? You're from France but now you live in Holland, your mother's Dutch, your father's Moroccan, and you've spent now some time in the United States, and a lot of the students in our profile training group are, uh, well, actually, we have a bit of an international group there. Mm -hmm. But that said, we tend to look at type through our own personal cultural lenses. Mm -hmm. So you're looking at it through all these different cultural lenses, and uh, I'm really fascinated by that because I think sometimes we suspect that uh, our relationship to type is very much influenced by our personal upbringings. Have there been any observations that you've made or anything that's come up seeing sort of this cross section or intersection of the type system and all these different cultures that you are a part of? I think there's definitely influences. Um, I see it even doing personality profiling sessions myself. Like, where the person is from is going to influence the relationship to different functions. For instance, my dad's culture uh, in Morocco is quite effy. So I did have a relationship with effy from a young age, even though that's not a function that I use within my stack. I see, for instance, in France, I think intuitive conversations are something that we do a lot in social settings, like at the bar or, you know, hanging out in parties. And so I have a very different relationship to that, um, I think, where that's always been something culturally that's very normal. And it's not as abnormal, I think, as in some other cultures um, to have those experiences. How did you uh, even discover type? Like, how did you stumble upon it? 
Uh, yeah, actually, I so I did a, a online test um, back when I was studying HR. They made us do this test. Um, it was actually doing my one of my study abroad exchanges. And I got INFJ as a test result. I got fascinated with the system. I started looking into it and researching and having everyone take the test. And I got kind of obsessed. And uh, I think I even let it go for a little bit and then got back to it. Yeah. And, and sort of just rested into that type and took it with me on the journey until I rediscovered my best fit type quite recently in the last year. Mm. And so what, what was that journey to go from believing you were an INFJ to discovering you're an ESFP? What did that look like? Uh, <laughs> that was a wild ride. <laughs> I'd like to say it was one moment, but it really wasn't. It was sort of like a lot of little whispers that added up over time. There were always pieces within the INFJ type that didn't quite fit. A lot of it did. And especially when I got more into the functions, um, I was going through a very tough time at my job, I was actually going through a burnout. And so a lot of the FE advice of taking care of your own needs and all that stuff was exactly what I needed to hear. And it really helped me um, navigating that that phase or that season in my life. You know, once, once that season was kind of over, that chapter was closed, there was just a lot of pieces that didn't quite fit or people describing their experiences with FETI, for instance, where I just couldn't quite find myself. Yeah, so it's been a buildup of a series of little things, going to profiler training, having the FI embodiment exercise be so powerful for me. Um, and I always attributed that to, you know, just having a lot of FI people in my life. Or So it's just a lot of little pieces. This last year for me, uh, what really moved the needle was I was doing a lot of sessions um, and just being able to witness what these types actually look like, seeing these functions play out in real life. So it was no longer just a theory, but being able to really interact with those functions was a big piece. Yeah, I got to take an advanced course um, uh, that's taught by personality hacker in advanced profiling. That also really helped put some pieces back into place, um, for instance, with discovering a head FI. Hmm. So what it almost sounds like you mistyping as an INFJ during that season in your life, it it was almost like it was okay because some of the advice given to INFJs is what you were looking for. So mm -hmm. I wonder if you were more resonating with the advice than the type. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's probably right. And I think I didn't have a fr I I felt a strong relationship with NI. I think it really helped me to meet people that actually had NI as their driver and sort of resting into the differences um, because for me it's you know personality type is like my hobby slash passion and so I, I look at those aspects but it's very contained and it's not really actually zooming back it's not the way that I live my life all the time. Right so in the context of understanding type you were probably using a lot of that introverted intuition or perspectives mm -hmm. But it wasn't, like you said, a way of life. And so right. when you were part of a community of people that were talking about this all the time and running into a lot of people who did have introverted intuition or perspectives of a, as a driver dominant function, mm -hmm. then you're like, oh, this is the difference. Right. And so that helped you get to your best fit type of ESFP, it sounds right. like. Yeah. And so tell me about that. Tell me about sort of resting into that best fit type and... And the experience of going, oh, I'm actually, I'm actually a completely different type than I've been right. living or thought I'd been living for a right. while. Uh, it's been amazing. It's been a really good experience. I think so far, uh, a lot of the power of the system for me was also in understanding other people. And I don't think I realized how much, how much the system does explain until I found this type. Before, it sort of explained some things, but there were always a, lo a lot of loose pieces. And with this type... Like just all the pieces fit into place for me. Yeah, it's been a big relief. It's been, um, yeah, I feel like I can rest more into myself and it's exciting. So so yeah. as an ESFP, you're not supposed to be into type as much as you are, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the, the stereotype is that you're, you know, you're supposed to be an athletic person and not necessarily be into this as much. There are ESFPs that identify, and you might be an ESFP listening right now, identifying as that type and listening and you're into it. But, you know, the the common comments are, well, that's not really what ESFPs do. And in, even in our profile training group, there's a lot of intuitives that end up showing up or other types. And mm -hmm. so you're definitely in the minority in mm -hmm. those circles in us in some ways. 
how have you found that? Do you feel like, I, I mean, I don't know what that, that experience is like because I'm not an ESFP. I'm an ENFP, <laughs> right? I'm an intuitive. I'm an intuitive primary. I love being in the abstract elements of it and all the weird abstract conversations. But when you show up there, you have a, a few other people like Klaus mm -hmm. on our team, for example, is an ISTP and there's other, there's other sensors there. But what is that experience like Do you for you, I guess? Right. What's really cool about f finding personality hacker in all of you guys' work is that um, there was just a lot of content that you could work with. So you don't have to make up so much stuff, uh, which is hard if, you know, intuition is your little three-year-old. You don't really want to make up all these patterns, but there's a lot of patterns that you can study what other people have done, like what you guys have done and what other experienced, um, you know, personality profilers have done. And so uh, that made the experience a lot easier. I do notice how there's definitely still differences. For me, it's it's really hard to jump to a guess. And so uh, I noticed that is a big difference with me and some of the intuitives that are profilers where, yeah, I, I sometimes envy that where it's like, oh, there's a lot of certainty that I find very hard to find within myself. Yeah. I, I think also Joel was maybe asking about your experience of being a center in this type world. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a there's a sense that people don't always, they're not always fair mm -hmm. to sensors or mm -hmm. possibly even you don't get enough time really focused on how your sensory functions work, you know, like mm -hmm. in a, it's, it's more of sort of a oversimplified or maybe not as fleshed out. Do, would you talk a little bit about maybe some of the things that you've, realized as best you know newly discovering as an ESFP maybe some of the ways that you might not have um, been able to find that type earlier because of how descriptions you know around ESFPs maybe portray this type or descriptions around the cognitive functions you know of extroverted sensing or sensation mm -hmm. and maybe the question is what are some of the changes that you would make to some of those descriptions or how would you like to be represented in some of these writings or um mm. or content Good question yeah around mm. being an ESFP yeah uh yeah well thanks for um reframing the question I mean that's definitely been my experience of especially um extroverted sensing sensation is quite a misunderstood function has been my experience and it's also hard I find it hard to put into words sometimes and so that contributes to it. But I think there's a lot of there's a lot of stereotyping that's going on around, you know, especially if that function is your driver, then obviously you're a very athletic, coordinated person. If we zoom out, I mean, it's not like every NI driver is like a philosopher sitting in their room. So it's one expression, but I think it's become sort of the, the way we define that function. Um, yeah, it's just really helped me to rediscover that function to see other people using it and realizing how much it does and how much it can do. I think some of the big realizations for me was that really it's it's mostly about there's a sense of openness, like just taking things in without assigning like meaning to it or or any sort of judgment. There's an ability like I see it in the way that I listen to people and the way that I observe environments. There's no need to create a narrative around things. I'm just I'm just with the person and I just take in what they're saying and I try to listen carefully to the actual words they're using. Wow. That's so fast. I mean, I want to apply a narrative <laughs> to everything <laughs> immediately. I want to apply some pattern or meaning to it. Yeah. Like that's so foreign to how my mind works. <laughs> that's I mean, it's ingenious because and I've seen you in real life talking with people, holding space for them, whatever they're expressing you are very present and you're very non-judgmental. It, it's really shown up for you how I see you dealing with other people is you just really give them space to be who they are. You don't try to pre-assign a meaning or put them into a box as you listen. You just are genuinely listening to what they're saying. Yeah. And I think that's great. Yeah, when you say, wow, because we always want to do that. And I would argue often inappropriately we want to do that. Yeah, of course. In moments when a pattern or a narrative or meaning is not appropriate for this moment, we're still trying to shoehorn something in. Mm -hmm. And it's been super awesome to be around you the last couple of weeks because I'm observing myself through your eyes and I'm watching myself do that. Just throw out patterns of like, oh, this is what this thing is. And then I'm like looking over at you and like, 
I can almost see your eyes going, maybe, <laughs> maybe that's what that is. And it's really, it's a, it's grounding. It's like, um, it's like a reality check. Mm. And that's been, it's been interesting to experience that about you. What do you love? What do you think is the best parts about being an ESFP? What do oh. you love about it? Mm, good question. I think the openness would definitely be one of them that it's like, even with rediscovering my type, I think it made it a little bit easier because it's easy to get stuck in, in the position that I was in. I mean, I was even doing this professionally and to have a lot of ego wrapped up in it. But I think having that function as a driver really helped me to just be like, well, it is what it is. Like, I mean, I mistyped myself and that's just the reality of it. So I like the openness of it. Some other aspects that I love is just the intensity of experiences. So like combining that sense of aliveness of SE with FI is just experiences like going to a festival or traveling or, um, you know, having really deep connections with people. It's experiencing all of life so intensely. And I just, I love that. Like it makes me feel really alive. And it, for me, that's what life is about. And I want, I wish more people could have those experiences. Do you feel like your lows are lower too? Yeah, 100%, 100%. And sometimes it's a bit indulgent. Like I like to sometimes uh, get into the emotions like uh, like I love getting worked up for other people, for instance, because it just, if I didn't have an emotional high that day, then it just like amps up my emotions. One thing that I love about those functions together, and especially within ESFPs, is like the fierceness, especially when it comes to other people. Like I think... I come across very sweet and very kind, but if you were to, for instance, mess with someone I love, like there's just a, like an inner warrior that comes out. And I see that in the ESFPs that I profile as well. Like if you poke enough and I like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the challenges you experience? do you think that's woven into some of that? Definitely growing up being very sensitive like just sometimes sometimes having emotions about things that you don't need to have emotions about it's just <laughs> um like i i move through the world very emotionally so sometimes it's like this doesn't warrant the level of emotions that you're experiencing or things like that yeah i think what you were saying the highs are highs and the lows are lows so definitely yeah i've struggled with depression times or things like that where things get really dark and intense as well I've noticed that with some of the ESFP friends I've had, one one ESFP recently told me that what she loves about being her type is that she picks things up so quickly, mm -hmm. which I think tends to get attributed to other types more often. But I've noticed that ESFPs, uh, she called it monkey see, monkey do. Like if she can just watch somebody do something, mm -hmm. she can pick it up almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed this to be a trend, mm -hmm. the ability to pick things up quickly. Like one ESFP friend of mine picks up instruments like crazy. Like she just... She can just start playing an instrument almost by, touch, you know, just handling it. Mm. Another ESFP I know just picks up languages like crazy. Mm. She's got to be in this in the experience of being around the language and then all of a sudden she's speaking it. Mm. Uh, do you find this to be something that this trend applies to you as well? Yeah, I think especially with the examples you're giving, like language or instruments where it's just being in the experience and observing somebody else doing it. Like if I... If somebody tells me abstractly something that's like, sometimes I don't have a frame for it, but if I can see somebody, like the concept of modeling is such an easy thing for me to do. Like if I watch somebody do something, it's very easy to then replicate it. Now, depending on how complex it is, et cetera, like it might be a harder thing, but growing up, for instance, uh, languages was super easy. Like my parents, you know, raised me with two languages, back at home and then I just picked them up like crazy like we would go to Morocco and after a month I would just be able to speak with the locals and so those kind of things like going to cultures and I think SE does it in a different way for instance than FE does because it's it's just observing and then copying what people are doing and so it's very easy for instance to fit into any culture because I just like when I arrived in the States that's one of the first things that I did. I watched how do people move and how do they talk to each other and how do they um, sort of trying to model that move with the environment. I'm guessing, yeah. I don't know this is your experience, but I'm guessing because of that, there's a risk for you as an ESFP and maybe an ESFP listening right now 
where if it's so easy to be a chameleon and just fit in, you watch and you just duplicate it. Well, this this means you may not be living from your own truth, your mm. own introverted feeling or authenticity co-pilot. Mm. You're copying what you see and you're just you're matching the tone of the culture. And so you may be living not for your what's resonate with you, but with what is expected of the group or the people you're around. Mm. Have you found yourself falling into that at times in your life? Or maybe you've talked to other ESFPs and you're profiling. Is that mm. something you think is a is a possibility for an yeah, ESFP? Yeah, hundred percent. Like it's one of the hardest thing about being that type. I think that having FI there as a co pilot, um, like growing up, um, like being what you know the the expectations, like in a TE way, like what role you're supposed to play, like how to be a good student or how to be a good kid or whatever it is is so easy to mold yourself through that and then do the SD copying I remember when I had to choose what to do at university I just blanked like it was just like I don't know what how do I make that decision like you have to tap into what do you like what are you interested in and I just didn't even know um, any of that and so experiences like that I've had experiences like that of like losing myself like just not having access anymore to my experiences or how I feel when obviously when I'm not doing great but I, I, that's one of the hardest thing so to create space in your life to to stay with with that truth of who you are so I would imagine that experiencing burnout at work would probably be part of something like this yeah right your driver of extroverted sensing or sensation yeah. is like it's already sort of in the moment present and my observation is fast, right? Mm -hmm. It's like a, it doesn't always work fast, but it seems to trend that direction. Mm -hmm. And then combine that sort of in the moment speed and figuring things out quickly with extroverted thinking or effectiveness right. as a 10 year old or tertiary right. function, man, you can just get sort of caught up in that almost workaholism. Right. Almost like ENTJs do, right? Yeah. Go in the other direction. Exactly. Yeah. So that need to sort of check in with yourself and go, wait right. a minute, what's going on for me? Right. If you get caught in that loop, that's a real challenge of checking in with the self. Yeah. So, so you we mentioned before being an INFJ after your, or thinking you were an INFJ after your burnout, it was a lot of take care of yourself, self-care. It seems you moved through that. And so now the recommendations for an ESFP is like, make sure you know <laughs> yourself. So can yeah. you talk a little bit about that journey of tapping into that introverted feeling or authenticity space. Yeah, well, and interestingly enough, the my burnout recovery was basically an FI journey. Like, right. I didn't know it, um, <laughs> and I didn't know my type back then, but, uh, you know, it was a lot of a lot of tuning into how do I feel and feeling my feelings, which was such a drag. And, and the, it's one of the problems with, I think, having FI in that spot is that feelings are slow, and they're they're intense and so it's just easy to like push them down and just keep going but obviously you create a depth for the future of then having to process all of that but it was a lot of work around like preferences even just figuring out you know what's my best call my favorite color or what do I like what movies do I like like redefining who I am without like you know how can I help or how can I be a good resource or things like that some of the things for me well that have really helped me on that journey was things like journaling slowing down music really helps me because it just helps me process sadness or things like that but also just a lot of it was learning to say no to things that like my schedule can I just don't have control over how busy it gets so quickly. Like it's just, even when I clear it out, somehow there's always again like 10 projects going on and things that I committed to. And so creating space is a big part of it because I can't feel the feelings if I'm going so fast. And actually that ties into the thing you were asking me earlier about um, what are some of the downsides of that, you know, that intensity is that's a real risk that, adrenaline feels so good and so within a work context for instance you really like I it's being mindful that yeah that you don't fall into that trap of just always doing more because you know going up the career ladder paired with the intensity of like stress feels really good if you don't have other more positive FI experiences to tap that that need for yeah. intensity does that make sense 
Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I'm sitting here resonating. I'm an ENFP. <laughs> and so I have introverted feeling authenticity is my co-pilot as well. I'm resonating with a lot of what you're saying. It's mm. for me, it was very destabilizing to get into that co-pilot. I felt like I was losing control. I was too slow. I was more emotional. You know, I was it's mm. just like, oh, this is awful. This feels horrible. Mm. And so I resonate with a lot of what you're saying. And and what I hear you saying is it wasn't all emotions were turned off. You were okay with like the intense emotions, yeah. the amplitude of it, and the positive, fun, you know, even even stress as long as it's applied toward that aliveness feeling. Yeah. But you're saying the more the slower, yeah. you know, the sadness is. It's like, oh, right. I got to feel the sadness or this heaviness of this feeling. Yeah. That can like, be a lot more challenging. Like subtle emotions. Right. Subtle, slower emotion, especially your own like I didn't have a problem mm. feeling sadness for other people or for a movie, but it's a proxy for actually getting in touch with my own feelings sometimes. Do you think the work was around giving yourself permission then? Like, was it really like, I'm allowed to feel this way for me, not just for somebody else, but for me, it's okay. I have the space for that. Yeah, it was a lot of that. And it was a lot of like, you know, maybe um, I remember when I had a burnout, <laughs> one of my first responses was, well, I can't take time off because I'm up for a promotion soon. And it's like, like, you're going to end up in the hospital. Like, you know, it was just it didn't make any sense. But a lot of the fear around going into the feelings is the TE things you're going to have to give up on. And actually, you usually don't like down the line, it works out. But yeah, it's the fear that you're slowing down and actually everyone else is like still running and you're now behind and things like that. So it's, yeah. We will be right back. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker. Now back to the show. How do you approach intuition? How do you step toward intuition in your life? Like, is it something you approach with fear and trembling? Is it something you approach with, <laughs> with like fun and, and eagerness? Is it something you're kind of like, uh, it's kind of cool in some contexts, but not others? Like, how do you typically experience it, experience it when, yeah. you, when you find yourself there? Yeah, uh, it's a good question because, I mean, that's one of the things that helped me realize, you know, my, my best fit type was my relationship with intuition where, you know, when it's when it's figuring out personality types and all that stuff, there's a container and that's really fun. And there's always like, you know, I have s some interest in things that are maybe more woo-woo and like I would read things, but there's always a container of a book or something you study. But when it comes to like, oh, try to think about your future and how things are going to play out, like that's like a nightmare. Or, <laughs> or even having to pattern my own behaviors. Like I can tell you all the stories, but I need somebody else to be like, oh, so the theme is this. I think that's one of the reasons why FI is so important because you're not tracking as much what your patterns are. So you, you're kind of making similar mistakes in different areas of your life or... I sometimes use the example of like friendships. I had more ridiculously unhealthy friendships growing up than like the normal average person because I just couldn't figure out the pattern. <laughs> and it just like took getting hit so many times to be like, oh, there's a pattern here. And like finally figuring out how to have like really good, strong friendships. Yeah. So then you said it's introverted feeling authenticity is really important for you then. Is it because that part of you, it's the part that gives you wise counsel or like how do you, f I mean, I, I don't want to lead you to an mm -hmm, answer, but mm -hmm. how is it making up for in intuition and patterning and that kind of thing being your three-year-old or inferior function? Um, so the way that I see it is I feel like people that have higher NI or it feels sometimes like everybody else in the world has this path that they're on or things that they're moving towards. And because the future is so like blurry and stressful and scary, I think 
if I make up for that because you're like, well, at least I followed my heart or at least I was true to myself. And so you're, it feels moving towards the future. Personally, that's how I experience it. feels like I'm going blind. Like I'm just, I have no sense of what's going to happen, how to predict or how to plan for it. But if at least I can look back and be okay with all the decisions that I made, then probably the path is going to be okay. They were true for you. Yeah. And that's you you can feel good about yourself making a true decision for yourself with the information you had in the moment. Yeah. And that takes the stress or worry off of what's coming down the road. Right. Yeah. The importance then isn't just knowing what you're feeling, it's also trusting your feelings. Right. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so how do you build trust in your feelings? How do you build trust in that? Has it been hard? Co-pilot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's really hard. Uh, I'm trying to think how to even <laughs> <laughs> begin to answer that. I Honestly, I, that's probably not the best way, but for me, a lot of it was not trusting them and then <laughs> seeing things go wrong and having the SE experience of, oh, <laughs> well, that didn't work out great. Like even with the burnout, as an example, I had a massive burnout at my previous work, but then I just basically went through the cycle of repeating it over and over and over again until my FI was done. So there's a bit of learning from mistakes, I guess. <laughs> so you didn't make the right decision for yourself in that moment. The right. cycle repeats. Right. The feedback to your driver of sensations like, hey, this isn't working. You're like, ah, screw it. I'll ignore myself again. And you do the cycle again. And right. then you get the feedback again. And eventually you're like, if this feedback keeps coming, I need to make changes and trust yeah. myself more. Yeah. And so then you make you make those adjustments. Yeah. I'm assuming then that there is a voice inside you going, maybe you should do something different. It's yes. just, it's before it was easy to ignore that, but now you're starting to go, maybe I should be listening to that. Yes. And I think um, owning your FI for me came with a part of responsibility. Like I am responsible for me and I'm responsible for my experiences and not waiting for you know, some outside structure, whether that's family or organizations to come and save you from whatever because ultimately you know at the end of your life you're the one that needs to respond to the choices you made so you work with us both in the business but also as a professional profiler mm -hmm. on our team mm -hmm. so clients come to you and you're a sherpa you're a guide in the experience of them helping them find their best fit type that's a service we offer here at personality hacker and you're one of our profilers you get a lot of experience in a professional setting working with real people real clients mm -hmm. You see types over and over again. You're in profiler trainings. You're, yeah. you're, you know, waist deep in the mud of this kind of thing. Like you just go through it a lot. Right. What personality types do you look at and go, oh, I envy them. So I wish, <laughs> I wish, I wish I had more of what they have. I'm so envious of, yeah. of their experience and how they can show up to the world. Honestly, for me, it's the NTJs. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. The really? ENTJs and the INTJs. For me, it's two things. First of all, their decisiveness. Like, I just love TE's sense of decisiveness because I'm the most indecisive person in the entire planet. Like, I'm just terrible. And so for, like, people to be so sure and so, like, we're going to do this, it makes me feel like, oh, like... Someone's taking care of this group. Someone's like, and with NI, it's just the the sense of, I envy the sense of certainty they have around things, not just within profiling, but just within a wider. I think that the worst part about, for me, about having NI as an inferior, and that's the pattern that I'm seeing in my sessions as well, is just a constant doubt. Because that sense of like, that sense that patterns give you of like, yeah, I know this. I like... I just know. I don't know how to explain it. I just know. Like, you don't trust that part of yourself. And so there's always doubt. Like, even there's, you know, there's my experiences. Sometimes I just know something and I feel so strong and it's such a powerful experience. And then I go to bed and the next morning I'm like, but what about this thing? And so my brain will destroy even patterns that I make by looking at all the exceptions to the rule. And so, yeah. Yeah, the further down a function goes in our stack, the more uncertain we are about its results, even if its results are good. Like sometimes we've done enough work in that function to be able to have a little bit of like legs to stand mm -hmm. on. But the one thing that's so hard to let go of is the uncertainty that we were really seeing it for what it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
Uh, can I route back to something? And by the way, I think everybody envies NTJs. <laughs> 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 Except for NTJs. <laughs> We're like, you it's don't know. True, probably. <laughs> um, I want to go back to what you said about learning things the hard way. Mm-hmm. I actually, as a fellow EP, now mm-hmm. of course I'm an ENTP, so I'm like, you and I are as far away from each other. I, I mean, if you look at the stack, the cognitive yeah. function stacks, we're like literally opposite if you take all eight into account. Right. So we're about as far away as we can get from each other while both still being EPs. Right. My observation is that uh, look, us people, us EPs, we got to learn things the hard way. Mm-hmm. We just do. Mm-hmm. So as somebody who... I like would, to say we learn things experientially. Yeah. <laughs> but, okay, you could say the hard way if you want. Yes, that is a more diplomatic way of saying it. Yes, we learn things experientially. Mm-hmm. There is a value to that, though, I think, mm-hmm. that I'd like to maybe give the person who might be an ESFP listening mm-hmm. a little bit of permission but perspective around that, too. Mm-hmm. I... I feel like our world or our society is set up to have people always looking for the right answer or get things right the first time, Mm -hmm. not make a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. And as an ESFP, can you talk a little bit about your relationship to that idea that, oh, no, you're supposed to get the right answer the first time? Mm -hmm. And then this idea of like, well, maybe I need to go through and experience the wrongness for a little Mm -hmm. while to really get that I don't know, that that sense of uh, trusting the self. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you say like the three-year-old is unsure and it's, I think it's also very simplistic, right? It just wants things so black and white. My and I wants to just plan out the future and be on a path forever and ever and ever. And so it really hijacks your ability to just explore different things, which is what the driver function needs to be able to make decisions. Like even with you know, my previous job, for instance, I felt like I had to stay just because it's like that was part of my path that I was on. I think that there's a there's a lot of value in, I think for me, the way it works is really, I really um, connect the dots backwards. It's not something that I can really, because even when I try to do it forward and future pace, it usually is very different than how I imagine it. And my my experience of future pacing is usually more around like fear or making a very gloomy scenario. And actually my experience has been that usually reality is a lot kinder than my imagination portrays it to be. So you feel like extroverted sensing or sensation, does it help with a bit of courage? Like if you, yes. if you give yourself permission. 100%. Yeah. And actually I think that's one of the hard things about that combination of functions because SE, I think, is really brave, actually. And it wants to be brave and it wants to be bold and take risks. And FI is so in touch with how that makes you feel. And so, like, the teensiest bit of fear is like, but I'm scared. And so you have these two parts of yourself that are kind of, um, yeah, that you kind of have to navigate together. I think that's something that's a little bit easier for the STPs where they're just like, I take risks and it makes sense to me. And so like, they just go for it. So then when you get into that co-pilot function of introverted feeling, authenticity, like you're more in touch with those like subtle emotions, like hesitancy or fear. Right. How do you feel that that balances it out though? Does it feel like you can take those germs of courage and make them bigger and go forward anyway? Or do you think that it actually throttles you from making decisions you shouldn't make? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually think it's the opposite. I think it's it comes a lot of a lot of the fear comes from the fact that you're not tuning into your emotions. So then they become louder and louder. And now you can't do anything anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, But if you're working with your feelings and your emotions, actually, one of the amazing things about FI is that you just get to choose your identity and you get to be like, well, I'm going to choose to be. X, Y, Z. And so you can look at an inspiring movie character and be like, actually, I can feel that within myself and like channel that to make something happen. So then what I hear you say then is if I am really tapped into my feelings and I'm feeling something like hesitance or fear, Mm -hmm. if I ignore it, it actually is controlling me from the shadows. I might prevent myself from doing something I should be doing. Right. Because I've got this thing that I haven't named holding me back. Right. But if I'm listening to some of these subtle emotions and I go, okay, I'm feeling fear around this and acknowledge it and look at it and go, 
yeah, but maybe I can overcome that. Maybe I can watch something inspiring or mm. or just process the emotion through and then get into back into that yeah. motion. Right. And it goes back to that responsibility of like, at the end of the day, what is the choice that's going to make you proud or make you feel in alignment or make you feel like you you made the best choice for you? That's usually the bolder choice. I want to route back to something you kind of just said as an aside mm -hmm. a little bit ago. Whereas your three-year-old function of introverted intuition or perspectives, you you almost said you like set and forget it. Like you, mm -hmm. you like to just kind of set a tone for the future on like a railroad track right. of life, right. using metaphor, right. <laughs> a perspective metaphor, setting on a railroad track into the future and you don't really like to have to revisit that as much. Right. That's I guess it's not unexpe unexpected or surprising because... I think all introverted perceiving functions in that position, or both of them would have that kind of experience, but maybe unpack that a little bit more. What's yeah. that like for you? Like, how does that show up exactly? Yeah, there's something really childlike about it where it's like, but I made the plan and why do I now have to do that again? There's a desire for like just making the perfect plan and then never touching it ever again. If I see people that, which I didn't know, but people that have high and I, like being around them, it's like, they're just constantly working on the plan and they're constantly refining it and simulating. And for me, usually I'll just ignore it for a long time. And then every six months or so, I get a big crisis and I'm like, where am I going? What am I doing? And <laughs> I remember having this conversation with my sister, actually, where I was like, why am I always like talking about my future? Like I shouldn't have to, I shouldn't have to do that or something. And it's just... um it's it's very unrealistic it's a very unrealistic view of how much people actually craft um those things and it's like the sense of like oh i should just spend 10 minutes on it and be done gotcha so it's almost like an oversimplification a cartoonized version of how the future works for you right right gotcha that is i mean that's fascinating and i think that's something that probably a lot of people wouldn't necessarily understand about like an ESFP mm -hmm. personality type. And I'm sure ESTPs have a version of this too right. in some ways. But that's, yeah, that's really fascinating how you just kind of set and forget it. Yeah. It's one thing that I found really surprising doing the sessions, but something that I consistently hear from the ESFPs especially is I think about the future all the time. And it's not per se true, but it's that when we think about it, it's such an intense experience that we'll, we'll remember it. We don't really remember the SC moments that we're in all the time in the water in which we swim, if that makes sense. Um, but uh, but yeah, the NI is just such an intense experience that it's like, oh, yeah, that's like, that's who I am. That's what I do all the time. Like, <laughs> Yeah, and I suspect that's why a lot of people identify as being NJs when maybe they aren't. Right. Particularly if they're SPs, because when they're there, it's noteworthy. Yeah. Yeah. And a distinction too, one last thing about that is that um, I remember talking to a friend of mine who's an INTJ and plans out everything. And she was saying, um, uh, I remember when I was rediscovering my type and talking about my relationship to and I was like, I do have a lot of plans for the future. They're just like this little secret thing. And it's, and she was like, that breaks my heart. Like, wh why is that a secret? And it's. I see the way that ETJs are about their feelings sometimes, like so secretive and it's only for their best, best, best friend. Like that's how I feel about my future plans. It's like this secret thing that I can only open when I'm really close to someone and it's kind of embarrassing and I kind of don't know if I can talk about it. There are so many patterns coming up for me <laughs> about our relationship to of our course interior. There are. Right. <laughs> can't stop it. Can't turn it off. But the the two things that have really emerged is just how consistent the pattern of our relationship to our inferior is in that concept of set and forget. Mm. I mean, this is why mm. a lot of ENPs, I think, get kind of caught in a life that is just sort of what they did the day before. And five years will have gone by and they're like, why am I still doing this? Mm. I wanted to do something else. Why did I never do it? Mm. And it's like you get sort of trapped yeah. in the set and forget of your inferior. I've seen this with ITPs, right. with extroverted feeling. Right. Sometimes they're the ones who are the biggest enforcers of some social rules because they learn that one right. and they set and forget it and there's no yeah. flexibility around yeah. it. So it's almost like an inflexibility. And yeah. then the other pattern is the idea of it being secretive. It's just for you. Right. Yeah. It's like a... 
it's like you only share it with the people that you really love. Yeah. And uh, and I think that those are th- those are um, great just general patterns of yeah. our relationship to our inferior. But I I really enjoy hearing how it applies to introverted intuition mm. specifically for you. Yeah. Talk a little bit about now that you've been doing so many professional sessions and all this, you've seen so many patterns emerge with other types. Mm-hmm. What do you wish people knew about personality type? I mean, we kind of mm. kind of conclude our conversation yeah. maybe with this. Like, what is the message you'd love to get out there mm-hmm. as an ESFP doing this professionally, redefining your type, all the experiences you've been through? Mm-hmm. How could you maybe share something with us and the person listening? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a broad question, but I think. Uh, I think it would be something along the lines of um, not making assumptions. Like I think for me, it's been so powerful to rediscover my type even so late on my journey. And I just, I honestly wish it on anybody. Like like to not get stuck in this is what I think my type is or, or feel like you're too far in your journey to even reconsider it. It went from like being disheartened by like how often I got it wrong to just the joy of the discovery of like I mistyped this person too particularly particularly people that are really close to me where I have way too much information to like get the right pattern yeah it's it's been a joy to sort of go through that process and rediscover it and so I think it's uh the framework of there is so much more than meets the eye the model and the car model really help to have a framework and then realizing you know, people have a relationship with all four of them and actually all eight functions and they're individuals. There's so much more complexity. So you guys talk a lot about this idea of like the system serving us and not the other way around. And I really believe in that. You asked a question, Jill, it almost sounds like a wrap up, but I actually have two other questions. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> I mean, if you if you want to ask more, I think uh, <laughs> Ines has got good stuff to share, so yeah. please do. Yeah, well, I did want to, we do only dipped into your relationship with your extroverted thinking or effectiveness just a little bit. Mm-hmm. And we talked about the loop that you were in and how that might have caused some burnout. But can you talk about the healthy aspects mm-hmm. of your relationship with that function? So one thing that I love about having TE, extroverted thinking as a as a 10-year-old is knowing or having a sense for being a good resource. So like if I go into a workplace, for instance, I can make myself be what's needed and just enjoying, for instance, being productive, enjoying like which is something that came up later in life, but just a sense of like the joy that comes from like making progress, from setting a goal and working towards it, from like even within profiling, um, the joy of like building skills and like becoming better and seeing the result of the hours you put in. I think there is a sense of um, I love anything where I can see the the impact of what I do, like even something silly like hosting you know, hosting a dinner and I can logistically organize it all and I can have people over and I can make it a good logistical experience for them, at, you know, at a more simplified level than high TE would do. But yeah, I think those are some of the things that I that I really enjoy. And I think one of the things that I admire the most about TE is the sense of contribution that comes from it. Like there's such a helpfulness to that function and a desire to have an impact, a desire to give back and touch people's lives. And I really, um, that's a beautiful aspect of that function that I really um, try to live up to and some days more than others. But there's, I think there's that part of me that wants to, you know, volunteer and give back and impact people. And um, yeah, I like that about tea. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I do think that that's an overlooked element of it mm. is the contributive nature yes. to extroverted thinking. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I, I was going to piggyback off of Joel's question too about what do you wish people knew about type? And mm-hmm. I loved your answer. What I heard you saying was that it's okay to reevaluate your type. You you never get so far into the system that'll, that your ego will necessarily have to take a hit mm-hmm. if new information comes yes. and you respond to it. Yeah. 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 So, so to piggyback off that, what do you wish people knew about being an ESFP? Ooh. Hmm. You're asking to share our secrets. Like, <laughs> like I don't want to share all the secrets. What do I wish people knew about being an ESFP? I think one of the things that I wish... Uh, people knew about ESFPs is 
I, I feel like there's a lot of stereotype around how this this type is being portrayed within type communities. I think it's often portrayed as like shallow or unintellectual. I wish people knew, you know, just how many different expressions of that type are out there and how, you know, I think some ESFPs have PhDs or there's so many applications to those functions. It was one of the big pieces for me too that I always identified so much with the depth that's described for INFJs and realizing for me personally, my depth didn't come from NI as much as it came from from FI. But I think there's a lot of depth to ESFPs. There's a you know, a desire for that in connections in the way that they show up to the world. So, yeah. So we so appreciate you being willing to be on the podcast. Thank you. And come and talk about what it's like to be an ESFP. Uh, Before we wrap it up, do you have any final thoughts or just something you think should be said? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that I want to share, and it's one of the reasons I, I wanted to be on this podcast is ESFP was such an unexpected type for me. Like it was a type I hadn't even considered at all. Like I never in a million years considered I was a sensor. I never in a million years considered that I was an extrovert because I'm relatively quiet energy wise. The the thing that I would love to share with people from my personal experience and also, you know, doing, guiding people through the process of personality profiling and helping them figure out their best fit type is to not dismiss any type and don't limit yourself to maybe some of the stereotypes or some of the experiences you've had in your life with different personality types because there's just such a relief and a joy in finding your true type. And I just really wish everybody to have that experience. Keep your eye out for Ines, whether she's working with Personality Hacker in the future or not. We don't know because she can't really look into the future and (laughs) be chill with it. We hope she's still with us in the future, but no matter what she ends up doing, keep an eye on her because I think she's going to be stepping more and more into leadership in her life. I can see her with a heart for people, caring about Mm -hmm. others and connecting with people, helping guide them on the journey of finding themselves, having an encounter with themselves. I I appreciate you, Ines, and I think you've Mm -hmm. got a heart for people regardless of what you apply it to. I think people are going to love being in your energy and having you help guide and lead them in whatever you choose to do in life no matter what that is going forward so i'm excited for you and excited for people that come into your world and just thank you so much ines for being on the podcast we really appreciate it thank you for having me so if you've been listening along whether you're an esfp or not we want to hear from you the fourth person in this conversation but you have not had a microphone now's your chance to make your voice heard come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode Leave a comment, ask a question, or more importantly, share your personal story. Maybe you're an ESFP who's been through some experiences like Ines was sharing today, and you figured some things out, or maybe you're still in a struggling moment and you're you're looking for advice and you've got some stories to share about where you are in your life. We want to hear from you. We think it's valuable to hear your personal story and understand about where you're coming from. Or maybe you have an ESFP in your life, or you had some insights around, oh, you know, I never thought about my, my brother's an ESFP. I never realized that this might be going on for him or this other person in my life. I want to hear about those too. So come over to personalityhacker.com directly below this episode. Make your voice heard. And if you enjoyed this podcast, you can subscribe to us on iTunes and various Android platforms. If you leave us a rating and review on iTunes, that helps us out a lot. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. You can get it at all major book retailers. And if you leave us a rating and review on Amazon or on Goodreads, that also helps us out a lot. We have a suite of programs that are all personal growth oriented through the lens of personality types. Check us out at personalityhacker.com. Look through our catalog of programs and see if there's one that's right for you. Antonia, I do want to pause and just highlight something you said. You kind of just blew right through it. We have a book. It's called Personality Hacker. It's available And if you heard this interview and you'd like to learn more about your specific personality type, no matter what type you are, but also just get a little more depth around the system, it's a great resource. We, in the book, break down the entire cognitive function system, how this works, how your mind is wired, and how it works in general. So, And it's, it's a workbook. It's in a workbook format. So you can learn a little bit and then reflect and make sure you're learning you know, learning it accurately, you can reflect back and take notes and journal back to yourself to le- to make sure you're learning the system in a proper way. It's an easy, accessible resource. You can get on all major book retailer websites and stuff, or more importantly, order it through your local bookstore, which would be awesome because you can support local bookstores. And I think it's a great starting place for a lot of people. We don't really mention, we don't really go into the details of how 
how I think the book is set up in a way to learn the system well. All right. Joel says go get the book. Yeah. All right. My name is Joel Mark Witt. And I'm Antonia Dodge. And we'll talk with you on the next Personality Hacker Podcast. If you're focused on personal growth, I think you'll resonate with our core content over at personalityhacker.com. We want to see you understand how your mind is wired so you can generate motivation, improve social skills, find career opportunities, and master excellent decision making. But a quick warning, we are advice and action focused in all of our articles, podcasts, and videos. This means that we attract people who like to be challenged to become excellent, to take action, to put in the work to optimize themselves, not simply just gather more information. If you are committed to personal growth and ready to radically find your inner truth, then come over and be a part of our growing community of like minds at Personality Hacker.